Live from New Orleans, Louisiana, it's the Cube covering .next Conference 2018. Brought to you by Nutanix. Welcome back to theCUBE, SiliconANGLE Media's live production of Nutanix.next conference here in New Orleans, Louisiana. I'm Stu Miniman, joined by my co-host Keith Townsend. Happy to welcome back to the program, also fresh off the keynote state, stage, the founder, CEO, and chairman of the publicly traded Nutanix. Dheeraj Pandey, thanks my for pleasure. joining us. Thank you for your time, by the way. Uh, Dheeraj, it, it's always a pleasure. You know, one of the things we say about theCUBE is we want to take those conversations that we're having at events in the industry and share them out. And, and we've, we've had the, the opportunity to have many of them mm -hmm. uh, over the years. Mm -hmm. So to, to start off with, you know, when you take us back, some of the keynote you say, five years ago, couldn't really predict what was going to happen now. Yet, I talked in our open here, the first interview that we did with you back in 2012, talking about the challenges over time and distributed architectures, it's more real today than it was back in 2012. Cloud has matured and is a little bit more nuanced today. The application space is you know, exploding and changing more than ever. Bring us inside a little bit. When you talk about the, the, the vision that you had for Nutanix, any major learnings on things that have surprised you along the way, and what, what things have played out exactly like you thought they would? Mm. Well, uh, we'll start with the easy one, which is the way things have played out, what we wanted them to play out like. Um, I think the idea of commoditization of hardware, the fact that things will become pure software, things, all these hardware devices should look like apps, uh, was one of our sort of big uh, prognosis uh, early on, like six, seven, eight years ago. And largely, everybody is talking about software define everything. You know? um, and that's not to say that hardware doesn't play a role, it's just that it becomes uh, you know, more invisible in the sense that you know, with software running on top and the fact that you have uh, economies of scale coming with standardization in hardware, you know, a lot of things will move to pure software. That's really worked out well. Uh, disaggregation has worked out well in our favor. The fact that you would start stop uh, buying big things and you start small and pay as you grow. Um, I think uh, consumerization has really, I mean, and this is a word that is a cliche in many senses, but what does it mean to have consumer grade experience of uh, enterprise grade systems, you know, which is a paradox in itself to say that you have consumer grade experience for enterprise grade systems, but I think that has turned out really well for us. And I think the staying power uh, of everything eventually is can you build reliable systems? Can you build highly available systems? You know, uh, I mean, because building trust with the enterprise uh, is really hard. Uh, and uh, there's lots of startups that have come and gone that have over-promised and under-delivered. And I think uh, that's one of the things that has really worked in our favor to be uh, you know, really methodical and robust with the way we build our systems, especially the back-end systems. And, and, and it's showing up in the front-end as well. Surprise, surprise, I think, uh, the fact that it's mega distributed now, not just distributed, because distributed over a LAN is one thing, but distributed over a WAN is a very different thing altogether, and you need to really think about the basic tenets of computer science, about state and migration and caching, and a lot of this is coherency, consistency, uh, availability, network partitioning, there's a lot of things you need to think about in a very different way than you used to think about on the LAN itself. Right? Yeah. Um I want to drill into one of the things, the, the move to a software model. Uh, uh, you, you and I have talked since, since the early days in Nutanix at its core, it's software what you do. Changing how people think and consume and, you know, boy, getting the financial uh, arm of companies, your channel partners, your salespeople, and your customers, that, that's a challenging piece there. Uh, there, was, there was one of the customers I've already talked to this week that said, you know, one of, the, one of the things we always had was, you know, I buy stuff and you tend to overbuy and you could never kind of shrink down. Now, when I, if I go to a software model, uh, I, I have a certain piece of it that I really understand and then I buy and I can even kind of dial back as needed. Maybe explain some of the nuances and some of those changes. You know, how's the field doing with this? How's the sure. channel adopting to this? And Absolutely. any customer stories, yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, the, there's a, especially for ambitious companies, there's always a Netflix moment, there's always an Adobe Omniture mo uh, moment, you know. 
Look at these companies. Uh, Ten years ago, Adobe was a $3 billion company in 2007. But they said we need to dramatically look at consumption model as the big differentiator going forward, actually. Even though they had digitized the Blockbuster and Hollywood videos and so on, they said it's not enough. You need to digitize even further. I mean, Apple had digitized music with 99 cent songs, but the music player itself needed digitization. And I think that's what happened with uh, iPhone, bringing a music player on a, as an app itself. Uh, photography was digitized, you know, because you could now do JPEG files back and forth in emails. But the camera itself needed further digitization and the camera became an app. So I think there is multiple layers of digitization that needs to happen. I think as a company, we digitized a lot of hardware devices. But as a company, we had to digitize ourselves even further. And this, is, this is our digital transformation. The fact that you can consume Nutanix in ways that are even more invisible. Uh, the fact that you can try out Nutanix, kick the tires on Nutanix, run it in your favorite server that you want, and then after you liked it, you call us. You know, all of a sudden, uh, the sales funnel is warmer because you look at sales funnel, you don't need people up there uh, to really go do uh, POCs and kick the tires and the technology and so on. So software provides access, which is probably at the core of an operating system. If you don't have access, if you're not freely distributable, then you'll always stay you know, at the mercy of the appliance gravity. You know? Because appliance is gravity, it's hardware. You need to ship things, there's physical objects being shipped, there is logistics, there is capital expenditure, there's a lot of things involved that really keeps you sort of uh, anchored to the bottom. And the only way to unleash this is to really uh, bring more digital de delivery models and software is one such thing. Now, um, you know, our sales teams, uh, like, this starting this quarter being paid on software only as opposed to on hardware itself. And we're doing things uh, in the channel that makes it really unique because the customer experience doesn't have to change. You know? In some sense, we're really saying, can we have the cake and eat it too? And that's what we're really doing. So that the true north, which is customer experience, uh, doesn't take uh, any kind of uh, hit while we can actually look at uh, going and selling the value of software itself. You know? um, and as you know about Xi, I mean, just doing software alone is just the first step towards digital transformation. And the further digitization is when nothing is visible on-prem for Nutanix. You know, everything is totally invisible. And uh, you can swipe a credit card and can sign up in a matter of seconds. I think that is uh, where the real epitome of digitization will be for the company. You know. So let's talk about the impact of becoming a software company. I'm I love some of the stories that you said, the, the ability to download software and kit the tires. I've seen some really geeky stuff, people running uh, Prism on bare metal clouds, just use cases that I, I didn't really consider. What are some of the more interesting things that your partners and customers are doing that you didn't expect? Like, what's the surprises? Well, it starts with uh, the tinkerers. You know, the most important thing about any good software company is tinkerers do things that you never imagined you could do. Um, and uh, it comes down to API, then it comes down to access. You know, like I have uh, an app on my iPhone, it's called iBeer. Now Apple opened up its oscilloscope, its accelerometer, its compass. And now you can basically fill a beer in your iPhone and you can drink it and it <laughs> works for you as well. I don't think the company knew that when it opens up its API, you know, what other possibilities, what kind of apps people will build. So I think uh, community edition has been at the core of access for us. You know, where people can just download it on an Intel Nook and do things with it. In fact, uh, the Nook is part of a drone now, so you can actually have an entire data center in a drone, and the drones can replicate to each other and fail over from each other. And uh, in fact, we're talking to a lot of very large oil and gas and uh, you know remote uh, vertical uh, organizations which are really looking for what does it mean to miniaturize the data center. And then at the same time do very serious stuff in it, back it up, encrypt it, uh, compress it, uh, replicate it, all sorts of things. I mean, put uh, event processing, like how do you put a Kafka bus on a mini PC, uh, PC size server, I think, farm size server. These are all the things that we hadn't imagined uh, three, four, five years ago. But the fact that Nutanix can be shrunk wrapped into uh, a palm size server, you know, it takes this possibility to the edge to the next uh, level, actually. So the show floor is growing. You hit on API. 
critical part of building an ecosystem to becoming a true platform player. What are some of the more impressive parts of growth when it comes to ecosystem? Uh, I would uh, bring it back to all the applications. You know, we've done a tremendous job of applications on Nutanix. Uh, so if you look at north, south, and east, west, you know, I always look at things north, south, east, west. North, south is apps and hardware. So hardware platforms and apps on top of us. I think we've done a really good job of that. East, west, you know, look at data protection, business continuity, security. Um, a lot of those companies are actually part of our overall ecosystem. And, you know, uh, we're still not happy. I think we, we have to do an even better job. Like, what's the MuleSoft equivalent in infrastructure? Nobody thinks of integration in the operating system world today. It's mostly point to point. Okay, I am Nutanix, you are Arista, we'll do point to point. I am Nutanix, you are F5, we'll do point to point. But what if there's a real event bus where you could just publish topics and you become a radio station? You know, and there's TiVo in because you can go back in time, look at three days ago, what events happened and so on. There's a whole aspect of putting a multicast tree of events that becomes a real groundswell of integration between different kinds of appliances, virtual appliances, physical appliances, you know, hardware below us, software above us. I think that has yet to happen in the industry and a lot of our developers are now talking about like what's the mule soft for Nutanix. So I think there's a lot of innovation that infrastructure is not seen because we always think differently than apps. But if we thought like app companies, we do things like app companies. And uh, you'd see us in the next couple of years do something really interesting with, you know, build a, a system bus, which is a pub sub like model, as opposed to a restful request mm. response like model actually. Yeah. Dirish, give us a little more color on some of those partnerships. Uh, I've seen Google and IBM on stage in the past. You're now over a billion dollars in revenue, public company, so I have to imagine some of these companies treat you a little differently. And the ones I kind of initially want to hear of, but you're welcome to run with it, is you know, the, the, the server players and the cloud players as to you know, how you see, how much can it just be, we do our thing, and how much do they need to work with you? Yeah, absolutely. Well, look, uh, a billion is still a small number. Uh, we are more like VMware of 07. And the VMware of 07 was still a test and dev company, by the way. They hadn't done anything production at all. People are still tinkering uh, with uh, databases and Microsoft apps and so on in 07. So we are small. We're still not a very big company. Uh, I think there's a lot of headroom for us in the coming years. Uh, the thing is that we've taken the tougher route, by the way. Tougher route being we didn't have to sell ourselves to EMC to what VMware did. If you think about it, that asset was worth 60 billion eventually. It was sold for 600 million. It's 100x uh, smaller price to EMC. Because they actually seeded the ground on go-to-market. They said, no, no, it's really hard. We need EMC to go and really do the distribution piece. And as a company, we said, no, no, I think there is value in building go-to-market on our own. I mean, look at the cap table. Our cap table is clean. You know, We have dual class voting structure and things like that. The things that VMware would die for, uh, you know, looking at from a financial investor point of view that we have that they don't, because we took the tougher route to really come to build a business. Now, um, if you talk about hardware companies below us, and uh, when I say below, I don't mean pejoratively, but you know, the stuff that runs underneath us. Southbound. <laughs> uh, I think uh, NX has been a great way to build a market, because if we hadn't done Supermicro, we wouldn't be here actually. I mean, this architecture would have been a child's play, a science project, uh, you know, for a tinkerer, more so than what it has become over time. Because the server vendors took note. They said, oh, you can actually come and displace me. I would rather work with you because there's a lot of value we can bring to the table as well. So in that vein, I think uh, what we've done with Dell, what we've done with Lenovo, what we're doing with uh, IBM, uh, Fujitsu, uh, and what we're doing with HP's and Cisco's channel partners, you know, there's a lot of regional love that's forming um, on the ground with uh, HP's and Cisco's channel partners and salespeople, because salespeople are less political than headquarters. If you think about strategy tax that headquarters pays versus what salespeople do. Salespeople, I just saw a tweet, uh, I think you talked about an HPE sales guy, yeah. saying I've got to bring Nutanix to the table, because they, really respect market forces. 
know, for them, market forces are most powerful, actually. And so, above us in the cloud, I think definitely a lot of work that we're doing, Google, GCP. But I think, you know, as bare metal opens up, uh, you know, from these other providers, uh, we probably would be very interested to see exactly how Nutanix Xi works in bare metals of these public cloud providers. So you guys disrupted yourself. The, the, there was NX, business doing fine. The, you guys are starting to build a reputation of being able to support the large enterprise with NX, uh, some of the logistic challenges that you had as a small organization you were starting to overcome. But you decided, you know what, you're going to untether yourself. Let's zoom out to the industry. If you look at the industry and say, you know what, the advantage that Nutanix has, because we're willing to disrupt ourselves, what are the tethers that remain in the industry that you're happy to go before your customers and say, you know what, Nutanix doesn't have these tethers, and if we did, we're, we're easily disrupt ourselves again. What's the competitive advantage? Mm, I think it's a great question. In fact, it's a, it is the competitive advantage to say that the glass is half full and it's not a zero-sum game. Because there's two kinds of people in the world. There's the zero-sum mindset people who actually always think that you know, if somebody's winning, the other must lose. Uh, and then there are growth mindset people who actually feel like, of course, legacy will get disrupted, but the new guys will actually make further progress, future progress. So, you know, as a builder, you know, there's a bias in me and many of us out here in mechanics that you need to have a growth mindset. And in the growth mindset, just giving your software to an OEM partner doesn't mean that it'll shrink yours. It's possible that there's going to be more word of mouth. And the market forces will actually appreciate that. I mean, eventually, if somebody has a great relationship with Dell or Lenovo or HP or Cisco or IBM, we'd love to do business with them. And we have to relax some constraints because at the end of the day, you know, this is still not our cloud. Now in Xi, we can do whatever we want. But when we are walking to the customer, saying we want to build a cloud with you, with you is the important word. It's not for you, it's with you. And with you would mean that we'll have to bend a little bit backwards to relax the constraints as well. And that's exactly what we've done. No one else has done this. Same is true for hypervisors. You know, look at VMware. We go in there and we don't start talking about VMware right away. Like, you know what, let's talk about architecture, let's talk about migration, let's talk about security, automation, and someday we'll sit and talk about whether you need to pay for a hypervisor or not. Uh, I think uh, we'll do the same things with data protection and you know other things we're doing, networking and so on. We're not going to just come in and say, this is us and nothing else matters. APIs is everything. Yeah. I mean, think of consumer companies. They've always competed with their partners, yeah. and they've done a good job at it. They're like, look, at the end of the day, Spotify is a competitor, Apple Music competes with it, but I'm not going to not give them a level playing field. You know, Google Maps, Apple Maps compete. Uh, Keynote, Number, Pages competes with Microsoft Office. And I think the best companies are very good at being comfortable. You know, Amazon, the retailer, they fulfill more than, I would say, half their things not from their warehouse, but someone else's warehouse, and both parties make money actually. It's the growth mindset that creates large companies. Diraj, you're a technical founder, had great success with the company. You know, it's still one of the things I've loved in our journey on theCUBE is being able to document companies that you know, we knew from the early days and we've got over 2,500 employees now. Actually you, more you, than 3,500. 3,500. Congratulations. As you talk to people you know, in the valley or as you're traveling around the world, what advice do you give to potential future entrepreneurs, people that are sitting like you did in the early days and you know, have a vision for the future? Well, I've gotten a little more philosophical about organizational building. You know, um, at the core of companies that are building and growing over time is how do you keep reducing friction? And it's not just friction with customers and partners, but also friction within. Because orgs grow and you need to, you know, uh, if you look at organisms, you know, we have mitosis where cells divide themselves and become smaller cells and even smaller cells and so on. And there's a divi division of labor, there's specialization, there's all sorts of things that actually happen as uh, organisms themselves, you know. I think an org is like an organism, you know. And uh, over time, there's a lot of accumulated stress that develops, you know. And if you don't really go and address it, 
you're not a company. You're basically a business that doesn't understand culture. You know? So what I talk about with a lot of entrepreneurs is really fuzzy words like, how do you become authentic in what you do? And like I was in Bloomberg and I talked about the difficulties of Zai. You know, at the end of the day, most people, maybe not the 10, 15, 20% impressionables, but most people appreciate authenticity. And they're like, you know what, that is vulnerable, and being vulnerable is the best way to build a relationship, actually. So I talk about vulnerability and trust and organizational design and reducing friction and things of that nature, because once you are so many people, it's all about reducing friction. All right, well, well Dheeraj, one of the things people I know love about this show is you bring speakers that get us thinking, authenticity, hopefully one of the reasons why you bring theCUBE uh, you know, to the event. So thank you so much for joining us again. Always a pleasure. Pleasure. All right, Keith Townsend and I, Stu Miniman, will be back with lots more coverage here of the Nutanix.next Conference 2018 in New Orleans. You're watching theCUBE. <laughs>